Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Hey guys, it's Darren. Welcome to the Touch MBA podcast. This week we had Paul Bodine on the show and Paul is a veteran MBA admissions consultant. He's been doing it for nearly 20 years. He's written one of the best-selling books on MBA admissions and he has a great track record in this space. So I think you'll really enjoy our conversation about trends in the MBA admissions world as well as his top three tips and advice to candidates over over the years on how to prepare a great and successful application. Before we get into the show, just a few quick announcements. Uh, One problem I've noticed, at least in Southeast Asia where I live, is that it's hard for candidates to keep track of who's in town and which schools are visiting. I mean, these are great chances for you to meet admissions directors and students and alumni of MBA programs. So what I've done is compiled a list of events in major cities across the world so that you'll always know which schools are in town. And you can even sign up to be notified uh, monthly on whether Harvard's in town or NCAD's in town or NUS is in town, whatever school it is. Um, So you never miss a chance to meet these top business schools. Um, So you can find this at touchmba.com slash events. I'd love to hear your feedback. I, I hope this will be just a great resource for candidates. Also, of course, you can come to touchmba.com and get um, some school recommendations as well as admissions advice. So uh, I hope to see you there. Let's get straight to the episode. I'm thrilled to have our next guest on the show. He's been doing admissions consulting for nearly 20 years. Since 1997, he's written six books on graduate school admissions, including Great Applications for Business School, which is a must read in my opinion. He's been quoted by the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and Business Week for his insights into the application process. And most importantly, hundreds of his clients have consistently gotten into the world's best business schools. And he's just someone whose work I I really deeply admire. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Bodine. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Darren. It's great to be here. Thanks for that nice introduction. Paul, before we get into the trends, what are your top three tips for putting together a great application? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. There's obviously a, a successful application is a product of um, many decisions that you can make before you even begin your application. And of course, many sort of tactical decisions that you make once you've started the application, such as, you know, the the recommenders you choose or the stories you focus on in on your essays. Um, But if I had to name uh, three sort of uh, high level tips, they would be um, be real, be different and uh, be a leader. Uh, By be real, I mean, don't try to fake the admissions committee out by projecting some watered down or, you know, overly polished image of what you think a successful applicant, you know, quote unquote, looked like. Uh, for example, a lot of applicants think successful applications have to state uh, post-MBA goals that involve social impact. One problem with this is that if your life experiences don't show strong efforts to improve the world or even your community, then you're, you're going to appear inauthentic. Uh, another problem is that most other applicants are frankly also stating social impact goals. Uh, so if you do it too, you won't really be setting yourself apart. And this sort of segs into my next tip, which is being different. And what do I mean by that? This just means stepping back from your profile and asking what you think you bring to a business school class that others won't. So uh, most applicants can find, I would say, three to five elements. Uh, from every part of their life, this would be professional, extracurricular, personal background, that when you take these together, these three to five things, they really will set you apart. For example, this could be, you know, working in an unusual industry, coming from a country that doesn't send a lot of applications to top schools, um, having a distinctive hobby, even overcoming a personal challenge like a difficult childhood or a health issue. 
even you know unusual international backgrounds. Whatever it is, you need to build your application around highlighting these differentiators, what I call differentiators. Finally, there's be a leader. Obviously, you know, business schools want smart people, but if you have the GPA and the GMAT to be competitive at a top school, then you really should focus your essays and your recommendation letters on other things. And I think if there's one thing that the business schools want in addition to smarts, it's, um, you know, leadership, the ability to sort of drive people toward a you know, common goal. Now, many applicants are not going to have a lot of formal leadership at work. So they, they need to try to demonstrate their leadership in school, uh, in their current extracurriculars, um, even in entrepreneurial ventures, you know, if, they, if they've done that, and even in their personal lives. So I think those three things, being real, being different, uh, being a leader, can be a great foundation for a success, successful application. Yes, and, and one of my favorite paragraphs in your book is, is in your last chapter, and, and you wrote that the odds of application success are directly proportional to the amount of candid personal insight and time you put into your essays. And that really relates back to all three points, but especially the first one, which is being real. And you, you, you said that many applicants these days are uh, saying they, they want to make a social impact. And, and to be fair to them, they see school websites and these school websites are saying, you know, um, make a difference in the world, you know. Yep. <laughs> so I, That's true. you can see how they would change their quote-unquote pitch to meet what they think schools want to hear. That's quite true, yeah. And, and you know, at the same time, a lot of applicants actually do, you know, want to, uh, an increasing number actually do want to pursue social impact goals. So I think you just need to make it sort of the goals organic to what you've done. And, and you know, you don't necessarily even have to say that, you know, social entrepreneurship or whatever it is, is your primary post-MBA goal. It could be a long-term MBA goal. It could even be something you want to do in addition to your career down the road, you know. So just try to make it organic to, you know, what you've actually done. Let's now talk about business school trends, Paul. I mean, you've been in this scene for a long time. What application and admissions trends have you seen in the past few years? Yeah, I, I'd say the biggest one um, is applicants are probably most aware of, and that's just the level of competition. I think, you know, it's just getting more and more intense. Um, I, and, and what I mean by that is I'm seeing uh, my, my clients' average GMAT scores are going up. The quality of the impact, you know, they've already had in their careers is higher than it was even a few years ago. The, even the diversity of their international experience ha has gone up. I mean, I just think that the quality of, of applicants is getting stronger. I mean, as you said, I've been doing this for, you know, X number of years. And the people I work with now are at least as strong as uh, I've ever worked with. And, and generally, the, the, the quality across the board is, is much stronger. And at the same time, they're facing a much tougher admissions process, much more competitive admissions process. Um, most of these applicants know, you know that the cost of an MBA is, is, is increasing every year, basically. And um, at the same time, the degree is a little bit being diluted as more schools kind of churn out MBAs. They also you know, very well remember the great you know, recession, and so they're kind of leery about leaving their jobs. So all of these factors taken together are kind of leaving them saying, you know, if I'm going to leave my career, it's only going to be for a top three, top five business school. And, and basically, it's because they perceive schools like Stanford, Harvard, Wharton, et cetera, the usual suspects as being, you know, the only ones that really justify the cost because of the brand value they provide and the, and the quality alumni networks. So, you know, some applicants are also saying, you know, given the cost and the, and the, the risks of inter interrupting their careers that they're only going to consider like a one-year MBA like um, INSEAD or Kellogg or or, or Canal. So another trend, aside from the level of competition, is the uh, shrinkage of the MBA application itself. Harvard last year reduced their essay requirement to a single essay. The rec recommendation letters are getting uh, shorter. Schools are doing this because they're, this is what they say, they're, they're doing it because the essays are becoming, they feel are becoming too polished and generic. You know, they're, they don't feel like they're, they're seeing the real applicant. So they're turning away from essays and looking for more quote-unquote authentic insights through video interactions or group interviews. And finally, I'd say just aside from the increasing 
level of quality of my applicant pool, of my, my client pool. I'm also noticing that people who start earlier in the admission cycle, and by that I mean, you know, basically January through March, the, the early months of the of the year before the first round fall deadlines are tending to do better. The the basically their effort shows. This kind of makes sense. The they're giving them themselves more time to do it right. And so, you know, this could actually be another tip for a successful application, you know, start early. So those are the things I'm saying. Wow. And, and so, you know, when you talk about your successful uh, candidates who started early, you know, what specifically do they do that that really helps them in the end, you know, by starting now, for example, right in March uh, before the fall application season? Is it researching schools or, you know, positioning themselves? What What, what exactly is it? Yeah, well, and certainly uh, researching schools, uh, reaching out to uh, students and alumni at their target schools, they're, they're giving themselves more time to do that. They're giving them more, themselves more time to, to do well on the GMAT score. Frankly, they're giving me more time to get to know them. They're also giving themselves more time to apply to multiple schools. And I, I think it's natural that the more schools you apply to, the, the, the better you get at your story for, over time. You start to learn what works best, you know, what what your strongest material is. There's also sort of a planning process. You know, if you start early enough, actually it could even be, ideally it would be a year to two years before the MBA. You can actually, you know, make decisions about your extracurriculars that can actually improve your, your the raw quality of your application when you do decide to, to apply. And by that, I mean you can be strategic and self-conscious about pursuing uh, leadership outside of work, for example. There are all sorts of things you can do. You know, even with only six, seven months before the deadlines, there are things you can do, you know, in your life, in your extracurriculars, in your career that can give you a better application. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. One thing I, I really love about your book is in the first couple of chapters, you talk about data mining your life and really getting all of you out on paper. So the earlier you can start this process of you know, listing out everything you've done, really self-reflecting on what's important to you and what you're really into, you're going to come up with a much better and stronger application. And, and which relates to my next question, though, which is now you only have one essay to do it. <laughs> I mean, you're talking, you know, we're talking years and, you know, it's best to prepare years in advance. But now the schools are giving you such limited space to express the three things you mentioned. You know, how are you different? How are you real? How do you have leadership potential? So what have you advised your clients to do? Well, it's, it's a great question. The, the, I'd say the most important thing is you've got, you've got this limited real estate to work with. You really, really need to be strategic and, and holistic about every single element uh, of the application. Because you have less space for essays, you must use the other parts of your application to compensate. For example, your recommenders rather than your essays can do the heavy, heavy lifting in terms of communicating. Uh, professional accomplishments, fast track credentials, so don't waste the real estate of the essays for that. Get your recommenders to do it. And so your essay then can be more about your leadership in the community or your extracurriculars or even personal challenges. Uh, another thing, frankly, I, I recommend that applicants use the much more limited uh, essay space to, to take some risks, you know, I mean, to basically get, get personal, you know, and this is where a, a consultant can help them identify well, what is a story that may be a personal story that has actually nothing to do with their career that might really sort of differentiate them from um, other applicants and, and and really give the school insight into the person you know because I mean, you've got you basically have less opportunities to connect with the admissions committee so you've got to use the opportunities you have uh, more strategically and even you know even the resume which most schools are still asking for the application resume that can be used more strategically to fill in data points that you might have you, you know wasted a, an essay on in, in years past even the, the the data section of the application you know the employment or extracurricular sections they're giving you opportunities to talk about what you're most proud of or you know why you left a position and sometimes you got some space to, to communicate part of your story there 
And finally, there's the optional essay, which most schools are still permitting. And, you know, now I'd say more than ever, there's no opportunity to pass uh, on the, I mean, there's no reason to pass on the, op- the optional essay. You should use it as part of your strategy for telling your full story. That's an interesting topic to discuss because I think previously, at least when there were more application questions, it was, I would say, generally frowned upon to use the optional essay unless you really had to, for example, explain why you like you weren't working for two years or maybe your grades weren't so good in college. But now you're saying, you, do you rec- recommend that applicants really use that extra real estate to paint a picture of themselves? Well, it depends uh, very much on the wording the school uses. Some schools, and actually many many schools, are very much saying, you know, this has to be uh, extenuating circumstances only. Some schools are are a little bit uh, more general in their wording, such as, you know, they're they're saying only use this space to tell us about things that you think we need to hear about your application. Um, so it's it's the insinuation is that they they only want extenuating circumstances, but the, the wording is, is a little more, more general. I'm sorry, general. So um, I think it's a uh, entirely depends on the strength of the story that you're thinking about using. But um, sometimes, even if you don't really have a, a negative that you need to do damage control on, there are things you can tell them. Um, it's very much a, depends on the, on the applicant. What's really interesting um, from what you've been saying is that it sounds like admissions committees are really looking for authenticity. What common mistakes do you see applicants making in presenting their their real selves, their authentic selves? Or how could they better present a more authentic self? You know, maybe that's a better question to ask. Yeah. One of the things they can do is just to have a little bit more faith in, in who they are. And by that, I mean to to not make assumptions about about you know a lot of a lot of the people I work with they have friends who've gotten into top programs and and they they automatically sort of triangulate their own experiences against their friends and and you know and of course as you mentioned they see the the, the websites talking about make a difference in the world so so they they start to think that I I think even unconsciously they started to think that well my story has to be fit into these into the box that the school is giving me or that my friends have given me and you that you really don't want to do that um you really want to drill down and this is where my sort of process of discovery or, or the questionnaire I give to to clients comes in you know this early part of the process where you really get to know them this is sort of identifying things that even sometimes the applicant doesn't think are interesting um, or doesn't even doesn't think it's it's something that belongs in a in a business school application and saying you know you should run with this because this is this is really pretty distinctive I'd say you know however you want to phrase that having faith in themselves or or drilling down a little bit more or or even just getting the perspective of someone like myself who's going to be able to tell you you know I've worked with thousands of people and and believe me when I tell you that your your hobby really is something that um, sets you apart and I mean there there are sort of tactical things that we can do in the essay itself that are going to make you sound less generic and this is this is sort of uh, more on the the level of editing there there are also things that people do in terms of their voice, uh, the the way they express themselves, that sort of tends to make a generic sort of response. And and so that's that's another way in which I can help is to say there's a more personal way of expressing. Yeah. And and from the admissions perspective, you know, I can definitely also say after looking at hundreds or, or thousands of applications, it's what really grabs you when you're reading an application as an admissions officer is a sort of a, a pleasant novelty. I love that term. It, it's it's someone who's it's exactly what you said, being real and different. But you know, it's someone where yes, they're very strong professionally. They know what they want to do. They're they're strong academically and all that. But like you said, what's going to push that person to the next level is that level of authenticity and really feeling like you know the person on the page and you've never come across someone like this. Right. And, and that is what you're trying to get at. And I totally sympathize with applicants because they feel like they have to be supermen to get into these schools. And, and 
And look at the stats. I mean, the stats are really intimidating. So your first instinct is just to list all your accomplishments and, and every incredible thing you've done. Well, th that's great, but it doesn't... Well, interestingly, you're not as memorable because it just sounds like, you know, you're just throwing accomplishments at me. I don't feel like I really know who you are. And so, you know, it's, it's now that there's less essays, it sounds like a real key step in the application process is really finding those one, two, three stories that encapsulate, you know, what you're all about and, and do it in, in a compelling and a human and authentic way. I, I know it's, it's easier said than done, but that, would you agree with that? Absolutely. No, I, I like your phrase, pleasant novelty. And I, I think, you know, as you were speaking, I was thinking of there's one other way in which um, the applicant can can connect, you know, with, with the admissions person. And that's just simply letting their personality come through. Not even that they're talking about any particular, you know, hobby or something like that, but just, you know, letting letting their personality come through. And this is where, where good editing can help, where we're getting to know the applicant uh, can help. And, and so, I mean, one of the things that I, I work with the applicant on is, is getting a sense of, of what their personality is and then having that come through in the way they write essays because they, as you said, they tend to be very guarded. They tend to, to play it safe because there's so much at stake. And they see the samples of essays out there in the books and they, they think, well, I have to sound like that. And uh, as you said, pleasant novelty. They, they really need to just sort of relax into being themselves. Yeah. And, and what's interesting, you know, you, you mentioned at, at the beginning of our talk that uh, you've seen the number of applicants applying to those top three, top five schools grow. Like, have you seen anything, you know, in terms of the type of student that's successfully admitted to these these top five schools? Like, any trends there? Well, I think that you know the cliche about schools like Harvard and Stanford is that that you need to be. Uh, the phrase I use is a brochure applicant, and that is you know an applicant that that Harvard or Stanford can refer to in, in their promotional materials, you know, like a former uh, TV anchor or, you know, professional rugby star, you know, something uh, way something way off the beaten the beaten track. And obviously, many people who don't have those backgrounds are being admitted to Stanford and Harvard. But I do think that, as, as I said, I, I'm, I'm seeing the quality of the people who who are coming to me for help is is at a higher level. I mean, I almost feel like they are being savvier earlier in their careers about about the kind of person that they want to become, and uh, even about maybe maybe about the kind of applicant they want to become. And so you're seeing just a lot more international uh, experience. You're seeing people who. Just to take an example, someone who, instead of just being a McKinsey consultant, which is quite an achievement, will become a sustainability fellow at, at McKinsey and, and, and spend um, X number of months in Africa or something like that. I think people are being more ambitious and more creative about the, the risks or the steps that they are ready to take in their careers and outside of their careers before they even come to to business school. Yeah. So one other um, aspect of the application process that has changed are these these group interviews. Now it's no longer just a one on one discussion with an alumni or an admissions officer, which is already very intimidating. And could you give any tips there? Have you seen anything work or with your clients? They've given you feedback on on you know, how things have gone. Sure. Yeah, I think in contrast to the one-on-one -on -one interviews, which among other things are are helping schools, you know, judge how you'll perform in in recruiting interviews. I, I think the the primary purpose of these new group interviews is to get a sense of how you will perform, you know, in the classroom or in study groups. So they're really trying to look in on what kind of classmate you're going to be, what kind of how you're going to fit into your your team. So you know, will you will you actually fit into the uh, the school culture and so the emphasis is less on in the interview is less on you know marketing yourself to the school and more on you know can you play well with others you know obviously this means that we are in these time, kind of group um, interviews and obviously Wharton's team-based discussion is 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 sort of the um, the main one um, Ross has one too but um, you need to kind of Keep sharp elbows, competitiveness, uh, you know, any kind of desire to kind of grandstand. You need to keep that in check and then uh, instead sort of really show that you can 
facilitate your group's progress toward um, solving the problem that the that you know, Wharton or, or the school is giving you, you know, in the interview topic itself, and and there are lots of different ways you can do that. Just as a couple examples, you can as this sort of conversation with the with the other interviewees is is proceeding, you can explicitly mention and build on other people's ideas in your own response. So it's not like you know they give you some. Um, solution that they they want you to propose at the end of the of the interview, and and there may be a temptation to st after you describe your own solution to kind of stick to your guns and say no, I think mine is you know is the one we should choose. But I think the effective interviewer is one who who uh, is aware of what other people are saying and is actually looking for ways to synthesize those other interviewees' um, ideas into into the idea that, that he is going to finally push so and or even sacrificing his his uh, idea his solution and saying oh i liked you know i like frank's idea better you know um, another thing you can do is to occasionally sort of summarize the group's progress to that point in the conversation and just you know show that you're you know in other words to help people frame the solution and frame the question. There are also little other technical things you can do, like volunteering to be the the person who who tracks time or 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 takes notes or or that kind of thing. All of these are just different ways of showing the admissions representative sitting in that you understand that the real purpose of this group interview is to show that you you can facilitate effective groups. That this isn't about you; it's about the group. That's the biggest thing. So, I mean, obviously, people may not realize that outside of the, the actual group interview itself, they're sort of being watched as they meet the other interviewees before and after the interview. Or the, after the group interview, they're actually being uh, literally uh, watched by the admissions represent representative. So, you know, you got to be on your best behavior and, you know, be collegial and friendly and and non-competitive throughout the, the process. And I, I think it can make a big difference. Yeah, interesting. The, every year it's gonna be different, uh, you know, what schools are, are putting out there in their applications. Actually, one, one, one question I wanted to ask you is, what about multimedia questions that ask candidates to upload a video themselves or maybe put together a, present, a PowerPoint presentation or a Prezi or something like that? What seems to have worked in, in that area? Well, you know, here again, it's I'd say taking taking risks uh, works, and and being personal works. Uh, for example, Booth, uh, Chicago Booth, they have a PowerPoint essay, and of course, it's not required. You can give them a, a written essay, but I would say eight out of ten times, I recommend the applicant do the PowerPoint if for no other reason than they can actually literally put a face to a name. You know, they can make images of their own life part of the process, and I, I think that's worth doing. That said, uh, people tend to think that, oh, the four slides have to be follow a certain format or they have to have a uniting theme or you've got to have a, a page about getting into booth, you know, with a picture of you standing in front of the, you know, the booth building. And, and that's just not true. I, I've seen really unusual creative things done in, in these slides. And I mean, another thing people think is they think they've got to cram the slides full of as much data and images as possible. You know, it's got to be information overload, and that, that's just not true. I've seen really, really effective PowerPoint um, essays that literally consisted of a single image on a, basically an empty screen for four slides, and it, it really captured the person. It showed some creativity in how they, how they chose the, the images, and that can work too. So I would say here again, uh, I think you know, what the schools are really getting at here is just another way in which you express who you are, and and I think they're basically asking for creativity. So what you know, whether you do a, a video or or you do uh, you know for for New York Stern, you can do a number of things. I would say take a risk, take a risk as long as the risk that you're taking is really sharing who you are. And I'd say you know this this means asking yourself what really matters to you. Uh, what do people think of when they think of you? What are the interests that really get you excited? I mean, and then if you can communicate that excitement in whichever sort of format you choose, you know, that's half the battle. 
Great. And I think that's great to end on, Paul. It's really clear. A big point is take risk. And if, if, if a school gives you an opportunity to show more of yourself, jump on it. Thank you so much, Paul, for your time and, and your insights. Um, again, um, you can find Paul at paulsbodine.com. That's his website and just his book, Great Applications for Business School. I'll also link to in the show notes. I, I, I encourage you to to look him up if you need help. And uh, th th thank you so much, Paul, for your time. And maybe we can have you back on uh, the show later on to, to see what, what else is happening in, in the admissions world. I'd love to do it. Thanks.